Welcome to the Metabolic Classroom. I'm Professor Ben Bickman, a biomedical scientist and professor of cell biology. Today, we're exploring a topic that is rarely discussed when it comes to health, and that is specifically the metabolic effects of fluoride. Now, this has become a very hot topic in recent days, uh, but you may know fluoride primarily as a chemical related to your toothpaste or your drinking water. All of it is used with the intention of preventing cavities in the mouth. Now, that can be debated, the efficacy, but the, some of the evidence that I want to focus on is recent and not so recent, but evidence that looks at the effects of fluoride on things like fat cells and insulin resistance and mitochondrial function and how all of that can influence cognition like Alzheimer's disease, fatty liver disease, infertility, and more. But all, of course, as usual, under the broad umbrella of metabolic function. Now, very briefly, I'm not a history professor, of course, but let's just take a moment to review where this idea even came from. The rise to prominence with fluoride really began in the early 20th century, where evidence suggested that areas where fluoride consumption was higher in the drinking water, there were fewer cavities. And this really started with a nationwide fluoridation in about the mid-1900s, with the main focus being to try to prevent um, dental decay. Now, at the time, this was really lauded as a public health triumph, but our understanding of fluoride has evolved a little. And fast forward to today, and the emerging evidence suggests that chronic fluoride exposure, especially from multiple sources like water and toothpaste and you know, other pro products you may be drinking or ingesting, can have some pretty uh, significant unintended consequences, including on metabolic health. Now, let's get started as we dive into some of the non-oral effects of fluoride by looking at the fat cells. You know, of course, of my affection for focusing on fat cells. Um, but fat cells, also known as adipocytes, are very dynamic um, cells with their growth and their importance on influencing metabolic health is second to none. Fat cells, of course, not only act as a storage depot, but also as a very active endocrine organ, secreting dozens of hormones and cytokines, which are, for lack of a better way of describing them, hormones that influence inflammation and immune function. But the effect of these is to regulate things like inflammation and immunity and appetite and insulin sensitivity. So if we disrupt the fat cell, no surprise that we have a pretty relevant disruption of metabolic function. Studies in animals uh, and some cell models suggest that fluoride can, in fact, interfere with the function and physiology of fat cells. Specifically, fluoride exposure has been shown to downregulate PPAR gamma. You've heard me talk about this in previous metabolic classrooms, but this is a master regulatory protein necessary for healthy fat cell formation, a process known as adipogenesis. When PPAR gamma is suppressed, precursor cells will fail to mature properly into functioning fat cells. Now, at first glance, that sounds like it's a good thing that you are limiting the number of fat cells a person can produce, but there is that's not actually healthy. There's a catch here. Um, that uh, that the when you inhibit PPAR gamma and prevent the formation of new fat cells, you force the fat cells to grow in size. And this is something we've discussed previously with regards to hypertrophy versus hyperplasia. Think of a, ha a healthy fat cell like a like a, a balloon. It inflates smoothly. It stores energy really well. But a dysfunctional fat cell, on the other hand, is like like a balloon that's sort of a little brittle. It can't expand properly. Or in the case of inhibiting PPAR gamma, it's expanding too much. And so it starts to leak a little bit of the air out. So air is being forced in, but now it's starting to drip it out. So the fat cell will become very insulin resistant in order to prevent further growth. The balloon's getting overfilled. 
Now, again, I've talked about this abundantly in the past. There is also this pro-inflammatory effect where the fat cell that it's getting bigger and bigger in part because of the lack of PPAR gamma, which fluoride inhibits, it also starts to dump out these pro-inflammatory cytokines to try to correct um, the reduction in blood flow. Now, as much as I'm describing this, I do need to disclose that all of what I'm describing is from some animal models and cell culture models, that the direct evidence from human fat cells is limited to the point of essentially nothing. There are some human fat cell studies, but no studies to date have directly tested the effects of fluoride exposure on human fat tissue, like a whole tissue. But there are epidemiological studies, which I am loath to cite, that have noted associations between higher fluoride exposure and greater rates of abdominal obesity and other problems that we'll get to, like insulin resistance. So it does suggest that there is, in fact, a relevance in humans, despite the direct mechanistic evidence to support that connection. So in short, while more research is needed to confirm the direct effects in humans, the current evidence does strongly suggest that fluoride's impact on adipocyte function is a legitimate concern for metabolic health and in the grand scheme of things may in fact be some other reason to scrutinize fluoride consumption when it comes to conversations of public health. Now, beyond the fat cell, and I've already touched on this, let's talk about fluoride's direct role in insulin resistance. And there is some fascinating research here. One landmark study by Garcia Montalvo and colleagues in 2009 exposed rodents to fluoride in drinking water at levels comparable to what's found in normal human drinking water. Uh, after four weeks, the mice showed impaired glucose tolerance. So they gave the animals a glucose load and then found that the animals that were getting the fluoride in their water it took them much longer to clear the glucose. So the glucose curve went much higher and took much longer for it to uh, come down. A sign of, well, technically that's called glucose intolerance, but uh, it can be evidence of insulin resistance as well. Now, one of the reasons they found this actually was an effect of fluoride influencing the uh, beta cells that fluoride was compromising the pancreatic beta cell's ability to produce insulin. Now, that does certainly start to um, step into type 2 diabetes, where if there is a, an inability, you combine an insulin resistance with a general reduction in insulin, in insulin production, you're really going to start messing around with hyperglycemia, and type 2 diabetes would be the diagnosis at that point. Now, even more striking than this study, um, the this reduction in insulin wasn't just a result of some compromised glucose uptake. Um, specifically, the beta cells have a glucose transporter called GLUT2, um, and that is what stimulates the beta cell to make the insulin. Now, GLUT2 was impaired, so there was a direct compromised effect of the beta cell to sample the glucose in the blood. But there was a direct effect at compromising the mitochondrial uh, mitochondrial function, causing significant oxidative stress in the beta cells. And then it was the oxidative stress that was hurting the beta cells' ability um, to make insulin. Now, other animal studies confirm these findings. Chronic fluoride exposure impairs glucose metabolism in rats and rabbits, which decreases insulin secretion and increases blood glucose levels. Now, I noted in human populations, there's a little less, but there was an interesting study in 93, in 1993, where they found that individuals living in areas with high um, fluoride exposure exhibited uh, demonstrable and significant glucose intolerance. So same kind of findings I noted in the rodent study. And interestingly, as they were moved to areas of lower fluoride exposure, the glucose intolerance got better. Now, mechanistically, fluoride does increase oxidative stress. It diminishes mitochondrial ATP production, which is almost always going to happen with oxidative stress, and it does interfere with the production of, the, of insulin. So this is a 
triple threat that really sets the stage for some pretty significant insulin resistance and, as I noted, type 2 diabetes. All right, let's talk a little bit more about the mitochondria because there is so much. I've already mentioned it a few times, but there's such robust evidence here. Now, fluoride has been shown to induce mitochondrial dysfunction, particularly in some very studied tissues like fat and liver. When mitochondria are compromised, the cells will produce less ATP, which is the what we call the currency of the cell. Now, when I use that term, I mean that it's essentially the thing, the currency with which the medium with which the cell will get something done that it will buy an action, you know, a nerve will have a conductance running along it, a signal, a muscle cell will contract and relax that idea. A, a shortage of ATP in fat cells can worsen insulin resistance in healthy conditions. ATP is needed for fat cells to respond to insulin and to regulate the storage and release of fatty acids. Without sufficient energy, if you will, the fat cell becomes lazy or less responsive to insulin, and it becomes more prone to releasing inflammatory cytokines. Um, now, let's transition from the fat cell and insulin resistance to talk a little bit about another highly metabolically relevant tissue, and that's the liver. Evidence suggests that fluoride exposure may contribute to non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, NAFLD. NAFLD matters um, because at that early stage of liver problem, it actually acts as a bit of a gateway where at first, what is just a fatty liver can become a fatty and inflamed liver. And then as the fatty inflamed liver state persists, it can then progress to a state of liver scarring. So to say all that very uh, technically, it would progress from fatty liver disease to NASH or non-alcoholic steatohepatitis. Remember, when you hear the itis suffix, that means that it's something's inflamed. So steatohepatitis, so fatty and inflamed. And then it would eventually progress, unless things change, to cirrhosis, which is when the liver is actually scarred. Just to put all this in, in proper context. Now, mitochondrial dysfunction in liver cells impairs normal oxidation of fatty acids, leading the liver to accumulate fat rather than burn it. In animal studies, fluoride exposure has been linked to liver inflammation, oxidative stress, disrupted lipid metabolism, in other words, promoting more storage than burning, all of which are hallmarks of fatty liver disease and a hint of worse problems to come. Now, a lot of the most recent scrutinizing of fluoride actually comes because of the evidence linking it to cognitive decline. So this is another area of increasing concern fluoride's impact on brain function. Several studies, including systematic reviews, have found that elevated fluoride exposure is associated with lower IQ scores in children. Now, that is all correlational, but fluoride may induce oxidative stress and inflammation in brain tissues. Also, something that's very relevant, but not really a focus of my lecture now, is the effects of fluoride on thyroid function. High fluoride consumption has been shown to disrupt thyroid function. Now, why am I even bringing up thyroid in the context of the brain? Because thyroid hormone is critical for not only brain development in the child, but also just maintaining brain function in the adult. Any pathology that involves the loss of the thyroid gland will include a disruption in cognition. So even in adults, in where we have brains that are fully formed, the person will become noticeably not demented, but forgetful and sluggish, lethargic in their thinking. Now, when you take that same disrupted thyroid production and put it in, in a child, then it becomes catastrophic, that there can be irreversible loss of intelligence and cognition. So there's a reason to scrutinize the evidence and the worries about thyroid uh, fluoride in the brain, and most specifically, perhaps some effect or some mediating function with regards to the thyroid gland. But also, with regards to the brain, we have that the worry of compromised mitochondrial activity. 
where the brain is an energy hog. It needs to be producing a lot of ATP to function well. And in the lack, in, in the absence of ATP, we have a bit of an absence in cognition. Now, I don't, I want to just touch on another point here, which is the effect of fluoride on fertility. This is a strange one, I know, but the evidence is actually quite strong here. And it's something that I think a lot about because I think so much about the family and the importance of the family as a unit within society. So a lot of my own kind of personal reasons to think about this, but also just I'm very mindful of people's struggles with fertility, people who want to start families and can't. Well, remarkably, fluoride does have a role here. Uh, research has pointed to fluoride's potential impact on reproductive health. In men, fluoride exposure has been associated with decreased sperm count, lower testosterone, and in impaired sperm motility. And in fact, in rodents, there's more of a causal effect where high fluoride exposure really does reduce sperm production. In women, um, high fluoride has been linked to menstrual irregularities and impaired ovary function in animal models. So there's there's less direct evidence in um, women, in humans, but in the animal models, there's a pretty strong evidence that females are susceptible to the effects of fluoride on fertility. Now, the where, what these have in common is that these effects are believed to stem from the fluoride-induced oxidative stress and some hormone disruption. Now let's think about some of the real world applications and what this means for us as we near the end of the mini lecture here. One practical step might be just filtering water um, to reduce the fluoride that we would be drinking. The main impetus for putting fluoride in water would be acting as some sort of sterilizing agent. But when it comes to drinking and cooking water, my personal view is that I don't want fluoride in my water. Um, if I'm ever going to get any kind of fluoride, it would be perhaps just specifically in toothpaste and then, you know, rig vigorously spat out and removed from the mouth. You don't want it, in other words, going beyond the, the teeth. That would be, that's where it is only helpful and that's only where I would want it. So my personal view is to use it in your, perhaps your toothpaste for people who want to, but don't drink it. Uh, so putting on some filtration systems in the home. Now, more and more states, like I am in Utah, Utah is now um, re removing fluoride from the drinking water. And so soon this might not be as much of a concern, but if it is a concern, there are some pretty effective filtration systems that aren't too burdensome financially that you can integrate into your kitchen and your normal drinking habits. All right, so in conclusion, fluoride is not just a player in dental health. Uh, it, it has an impact on fat cells. It has an impact on insulin signaling, mitochondrial function, liver health, brain development, and even reproductive health. And so it does reveal a darker or a deeper side of fluoride and its metabolic and other systemic effects. Uh, while we don't need to... I don't think we need to fear it completely and remove it completely, uh, that there could be sufficient evidence to keep it in toothpaste to help with teeth or oral health, but we should respect its potential to influence metabolic and overall health. Until next time, more knowledge, better health.